they buried that boy so fast, I guess to keep from people knowing what happened to him. They put him into that river and let him stay there all night long. On January 2nd, 1944, 15 year old Willie Howard experienced a sudden and heart wrenching moment when three white men forcefully entered the house armed with guns and other weapons. It was really shocking for Lula Howard, his mother, who was alone at home and frightened about what was happening. She begged with all her heart to save her son, but the men heartlessly took Willie from their home. Even more shocking is that they took his dad, James, and brought them to the Suwannee River. In a moment that painfully revealed the depths of his father's helplessness, when Willie looked at him, who was crying and couldn't help but witness his son jumping into the river. All James could say to his son were these last words, I cannot do anything for you now. I'm glad I have belonged to the church and prayed for you. So why did those men abduct Willie Howard? And what could Lula possibly do when the white men left the house? It all started in Suwannee County, Florida, back in 1858, when the people there, with a population of 44,485, decided to make it official and called it a charter day on December 21, 1858. Later, they set up Live Oak in 1863, naming it after those giant oak trees giving travelers some cool shade. This place eventually became the county's main hub. Tucked away in the soil-rich panhandle, it was part of the Florida Black Belt, where farming was the real deal, cotton was the star, and lots of African-American farm workers were in demand. One such ordinary African-American man, Willie Howard, ended up caught in the crossfire of some seriously messed up racism. But who was Willie, and what went down with him? To figure that out, we need to dig into the nitty-gritty details of the events from the very start. When Willie James Howard, a 15-year-old boy, was born on July 13, 1928, down in Suwannee County, Florida, he was the only son of James and Lula Howard, and they loved him the most. When Willie was little, he was a super smart, cheerful, and talented guy. He was a sophomore in Florida high school, and his friends knew him as the boy with some serious singing skills. Willie was the really happy, likable, and talented kid that anyone wants as a friend. He was all about staying clean, looking sharp, and being well-dressed. The boy was defined for his politeness. He showed respect to everyone, from his pals to the older folks. Plus, he had this heart of gold that made a bunch of girls in his community crush on him. A retired public school at the African-American school that Willie attended, La Francis Stevens, painted a picture of Willie as an extremely respectful and polite guy, a genuinely nice young man. According to her, if he spotted you approaching, he'd step aside with courtesy. Even though La Francis didn't get to teach him because she was all about teaching girls back then, she couldn't help but notice his cheerful spirit and melodic talents. Willie lived with his mother and father, and even though they both had jobs, it wasn't easy for them to buy fancy clothes and shoes for him. It also made them feel sad, as Willie loved dressing up, and sometimes resorting to asking other people for clothes. Despite his parents working hard, getting those snazzy outfits for Willie was a bit of a challenge. For such a bright and widely loved boy, he and his parents lived humbly and peacefully. Now, because of his habit of dressing up and being a polite and respectful man in 1943, when he was just 15, he landed a seasonal job during the Christmas holidays. It was at Van Priest Five and Dime Store in downtown Live Oak as a delivery boy, spreading holiday cheer with his deliveries. So back in the day, it was kind of a big deal for an African-American boy like Willie to score a job inside a store and do the deliveries. That spot wasn't exactly the go-to place for hiring African-American folks because of the not-so-friendly racist ideology floating around. Surprisingly, the store also had its share of Caucasian workers, and Willie was breaking the stereotype because he didn't look like the typical poor African-American person from his neighborhood or in the Deep South at the time. Now, at one point, when Willie was working at the store, 
he became really infatuated with a 17-year-old white girl who worked there by the name of Cynthia Goff. Willie, the quiet observer, used to watch Cynthia from afar, but never gathered the courage to talk to her. Now Willie, being his always nice self, decided to spread some holiday cheer. It was the festive season, and everyone was in a joyful mood with family and friends. So Willie took a sweet initiative and sent Christmas cards to all the female co-workers at Van Priest's store, wishing them health and happiness. So after spreading the joy with Christmas cards for everyone, Willie was on cloud nine, but his happiness didn't last long. Why? Well, it turned out that one of the store employees spilled the beans that Cynthia, the girl Willie had a crush on, was actually upset about getting a card from him. When Willie heard that Cynthia was upset, he got restless because he never wanted her to feel down. In an attempt to fix things, he decided to send her a personal letter. But little did he know, this well-intentioned move would turn out to be the biggest mistake of his life. In the letter he wrote, Dear friend, just a few lines to let you hear from me. I am well and hope you are the same. This is what I said on that Christmas card. From WJH with L. I hope you'll understand what I mean. That is what I said now. Please don't get angry with me, because you can never tell what may get in somebody. I did not put it in there myself. God did. I can't help what he does, can I? I know you don't think much about our kind of people, but we don't hate you all. We want to be your friends, but you won't let us. Please don't let anybody see this. I hope I haven't made you mad. If I did, tell me about it, and I'll forget about it. I wish this was a northern state. I guess you call me fresh. Write and tell me what you think of me, good or bad. Sincerely yours, with L, from YKW, to Cynthia Goff. I love your name, I love your voice. For a SH, you are my choice. In the letter to Cynthia, Willie spilled his feelings, sounding like he was asking her to be friends. He wrote, I know you don't think much of our kind of people, but we don't hate you. We want to be your friend. It's like he sensed that Cynthia might not be too keen on hanging out with people like him. But Willie was still hopeful. Even if Cynthia hadn't been the friendliest to people of his race, Willie, being the hopeful romantic, didn't want to give up on trying because he really liked her. So at 15, Willie had a pretty clear picture of what he wanted in life, and he understood every word he wrote in that letter. It also gives us a peek into Willie's mindset and a glimpse of how some people, not just in his town but all over the country, were thinking during those times. But one thing Willie probably didn't know was that Cynthia's dad was Alex Goff, a respected former member of the Florida House of Representatives. Now, we're not sure if Cynthia told about the letter or if Mr. Goff found the letter himself, but on January 2, 1944, when he read Willie's letter that he gave to Cynthia, he got seriously angry. Mr. Goff wasn't exactly the hang-out-with-any-African-American kind of person. Imagine his shock when he found out that an African-American guy, Willie, had written a letter to his daughter. For Mr. Goff, this was like a total challenge to him and almost a crime in his eyes. So, being extremely furious, he rounded up his friends, Reginald H. Scott and Selden B. McCullers, and the three of them decided to pay Willie a visit at his house, supposedly to question him about the letter. But they weren't just armed with questions. They were also armed with guns and other weapons in tow. It seemed like their intentions might have been more than just normal questioning with Willie, but they were planning something more serious. As Mr. Goff and his friends were on their way, Willie, who was still busy with his work at the dime store, got some unsettling news. A fellow employee informed him that three white men were heading to his house looking for him. This news got Willie seriously scared, especially since he knew his mom, Lula, was home alone, and he knew what those men could really do. So, without wasting a moment, he rushed back home to ensure his mother's safety. As soon as Willie got home, he quickly started telling his mother about the letter and everything that happened and why these men were coming to their house. But before he could finish, at around 10 a.m., those three men stormed into his house and started to forcefully pull him away. 
When Lula saw what was happening, she did everything she could to protect Willie, pleading with them to let him go. She cried, begged, and tried to reason, but Mr. Goff seemed totally consumed by anger and was unwilling to listen to anything. That's when things took a terrifying turn, when Mr. Goff pulled out a pistol and aimed it at Lula's head. He demanded that she hand over Willie to them. Being terrified and caught in an impossible situation, Lula reluctantly let the men take Willie away. As the cars drove off with her son, Lula ran after them, crying and screaming for them to let him go. But they didn't stop. Now, after seeing no other way desperately, she rushed to the lumber yard where her husband James worked in hopes to share the dreadful news of Willie's abduction. However, fate had different plans. Before she could even reach there, Mr. Goff and his two companions showed up with guns in hand and ordered James to get into the car with them. Now, by the time Lula reached the lumber yard, it was too late. Those men had already taken her son and husband, but there she met the lumber yard owner's wife who spilled the details about everything that went down and how those three men took James with them. From there, the car drove out of town towards the Suwannee River, reaching a bluff in Sulphur Springs. Once they reached the high bank of the river, Mr. Goff had Willie and his father step out of the car. That's when he explained to James about everything Willie was accused of doing. James, even after knowing that his son was innocent and didn't do anything wrong, he felt utterly helpless in that heartbreaking moment. The three men tied up Willie's hands and feet, and he just stood there, watching helplessly. Then Mr. Goff took on the roles of both judge and jury, and asked Willie James if he grasped the so-called penalty for his crime, which, mind you, was just sending a letter to his daughter Cynthia. According to Mr. Goff, Willie committed a crime, and he wanted to make an example out of him so that no one else would even think of doing the same in the future. Being terrified, Willie tearfully replied, Yes, sir, as he faced this bizarre trial, weeping all the while. Mr. Goff turned to James and asked if he had any words for his son. Powerless to change the course of his son's fate, James just shared some comforting words in what he realized were Willie's last moments. Willie, I cannot do anything for you now. I'm glad I have belonged to the church and prayed for you. Both father and son had tears streaming down their faces. In a poignant final request, Willie asked his father to take his wallet. In a small yet significant exchange in the midst of this heart-wrenching ordeal, then, without wasting a moment, Mr. Goff took out a gun and aimed it at Willie's head. He gave him a chilling ultimatum. Either jump into the water or face what was in the gun. Remember, Willie's hands and feet were still bound. He was gagged and forced into an impossible decision, where he had no other choice but to jump into the water and subjected himself to a horrific drowning death. Meanwhile, James, who was helpless, watched his son from a distance, ending his own life and meeting such a tragic end in front of his eyes. Even after doing this, the men seemed like they weren't satisfied. They took James back in the car and left him at the lumberyard, making sure he couldn't try to save his drowning son. Now, when James finished his work shift and returned home with a heavy heart, he had to deliver the devastating news to his wife, Lula. James sadly informed her that Willie wouldn't be coming home again. Even though Lula was somewhat prepared for the news, since she knew what the men had intended, but hearing it from James, she couldn't hold back her tears. It was a heartbreaking moment for the family. Now, if you think that's the end of the story, then hold on tight, because the story doesn't stop there. The white men went back to the Suwannee River, retrieved Willie's body, and buried him. But they weren't done. They crafted their own version of events, and here's where it gets really interesting. Mr. Goff, being a representative with some serious power, headed straight to Tom Henry, the sheriff of Suwannee County in 1944. There the three men gave Sheriff Tom a written statement in which they shared their side of the story. According to them, they picked up Willie James from his house and brought him to his father James with the intention of having his father whip him over the letter. Further, they claimed that upon reaching the river, Willie actually resisted his father's attempt to discipline him. According to them, in his struggle to break free, 
Willie accidentally fell into the river and drowned himself. They insisted that they tried hard to rescue him, while his father supposedly stood by, doing nothing. It was a strategic move on their part, telling their version of events in advance because they knew that the sheriff would believe them more than the Howard family. It was done to secure their innocence and avoid being suspected of Willie's death. But the question was, even if Sheriff Tom decided to buy into the story that Willie drowned himself, why didn't he slap them with a kidnapping charge? Even though they themselves had straight up admitted that they grabbed the boy from his house. Even back in Suwannee County in 1944, it was against the law to forcibly take a child from his mother. Yet, the white community seemed to swallow the story hook, line, and sinker. In their eyes, the African-American boy's demise was just a tragic accident. In reality, Willie was kidnapped, murdered, and buried within a mere 24 hours without leaving a proper grave marker. Sadly, Willie's case wasn't the only one and he wasn't the only African-American boy to endure such cruelty. In August 1955, another tragic incident unfolded in Florida with Emmett Till, a 14-year-old African-American boy who faced lynching at the hands of three white men, all because he supposedly got physical with a white woman. Racism has been around for a long time, and unfortunately, it still exists in many parts of the world. Many cases of lynching have remained hidden, which never came to light, and the stories often go unheard. Willie's case would have also been one of those cases, and no one would have ever known until one day fate took a turn. Albert C. Robinson, an African American attorney from Live Oak, then in 1944 living in Washington, D.C., came home for the holidays. There he heard from the owner of the lumberyard about an African American child being lynched and he was so disturbed by this injustice that just two days after Willie's murder, on January 4, 1944, Robinson wrote a letter to the NAACP in Washington, D.C. Little did he know that this letter would set in motion the involvement of Thorogood Marshall, who in 1944 became the first African-American person to serve on the United States Supreme Court, ensuring Willie's story wouldn't be buried in silence. The letter dated January 4, 1944, stated, While visiting in Florida during the Christmas holidays, one of the most gruesome cases imaginable was called to my attention. The people who relayed the facts in this case to me asked that I withhold their names, but implored me to get the facts in this case through to the NAACP as soon as possible. It appears that the conditions there are so tense that the colored people, high and low, are so frightened that they are afraid to have their names identified with cases of this type. After reading that impactful letter, Attorney Robinson not only shared the names of those he'd spoken to, Willie's father, James Howard, the African-American undertaker, Ansel Brown, Reverend R. M. Lane of Live Oak, and Mr. McPherson, the principal of Willie's school. But he also made a request to not publicize these names. Attorney Robinson's intervention actually sparked action into Willie's case. The NAACP sent letters to Florida Governor Holland, urging an investigation into Willie's killing. This move marked the first step toward justice for Willie. The governor also appointed Special Investigator David Lanier from Florida Law Enforcement Agency and instructed him to provide a discreet report on the matter. The wheels of justice started turning, albeit quietly. Investigator Lanier wasted no time and went straight to the heart of the matter, interviewing those involved in Willie's case. His interviews included Sheriff Tom, the three men implicated in Willie's death, James and Luna Howard. However, Luna, in her account to the special investigator, painted a vivid picture. On January 2, 1944, James had left for work at Bond Howell Lumber Company, where Mr. R. L. Howard was his boss. Later that morning, an automobile carrying three white men pulled up to my house. From that, two white men stood at the gate, in which one was named Mr. McCullough, and the identity of the other man remained unknown to me. The third man was Mr. Phil Goff. Suddenly, Willie walked into the house, and Mr. Goff seized him, insisting him to come along. I frantically tried to pull Willie away, begging and asking what he had done. In the midst of this, Mr. Goff produced a revolver, pointing it at me. He forcibly dragged Willie to the car, joined by the other white men, and sped off towards Live Oak. 
I chased after the car, but it quickly got away from me. Once the interviews were done, Investigator Lanier was convinced that the three men were responsible for Willie's tragic end. In his report to the governor, David Lanier straightforwardly stated that the men were guilty of murder if they were guilty of anything. In response, on February 14, 1944, Governor Holland wrote to Thurgood Marshall, attaching a copy of Lanier's report. However, the governor also cautioned Marshall about the challenges ahead, emphasizing the difficulties when the testimony of three white men and the girl would likely stand against the account of one African-American man. Despite having all the information, fighting for this case remained an uphill battle. The pursuit of justice for Willie took an unexpected turn at the Suwannee Courthouse on May 4, 1944. The state's attorney brought the Howard killing before a grand jury, but things didn't unfold as anticipated. In a surprising twist, the only witness summoned was James Howard, who had relocated to Orlando by then. The grand jury just had two questions for him. How old was the boy? Did he personally deliver the letter to Cynthia Goff? Strangely, there were no inquiries about what transpired at the river. Lula Howard and other potential corroborating witnesses were not called. Even the special investigator Lanier was left out. After responding to the two questions, James Howard was dismissed from the grand jury proceedings and was left in the dark about any further developments. But why weren't there any questions about those white men? Why weren't there any questions about how Willie died? Why wasn't it important for the state's attorney? In a final push for justice, Harry T. Moore, the head of the state NAACP and a childhood classmate of Lula Howard, made a valiant effort. Moore conducted his own investigation. He gathered affidavits from the Howard family. He organized an NAACP chapter in Live Oak, using the Howard lynching as his rallying cry. Hailing from the same settlement outside Live Oak called Houston, Moore felt a personal connection to Willie's case. He teamed up with Marshall, and they both aimed to involve the federal authorities. But, despite the compelling arguments presented by Marshall and Moore, the state chose to remain silent, which only added another chapter to the sadly familiar narrative of justice eluding those who need it most. He was going to the site of the lynching, he was finding the surviving family members, interviewing them, taking sworn affidavits, uh, writing letters to the governor, accusing white sheriffs of being implicated in the murder or of covering up the murder, and he just kept pushing it. Following the lynching, Willie James' parents promptly relocated to Orlando, where James Howard passed away a few years later, and Lula Howard lived until 2004. Mamie, Lula's sister, shared in a 2006 interview in Orlando that Lula's heart remained broken throughout her life. Willie was her only child and had left an indelible mark on her, a wound that time couldn't fully heal. Even after decades, some Caucasian individuals in Live Oak continue to cling to the drowning myth. In an interview on October 19, 2006, Susan K. Lamb, the editor of the Suwannee Democrat, the town's newspaper, adamantly stated, it was not a lynching, it was a drowning. According to her, the boy was supposedly running away and met his demise in the river. When questioned about the practicality of running with bound hands and feet, her response was simply, isn't that interesting? Willie James Howard was laid to rest in Live Oak's East Side Cemetery, resting in anonymity for over 60 years with no marker on his grave. It was finally in 2005 when Douglas Udell, a Suwannee County commissioner and mortician, took the initiative. Having acquired the funeral home and records from Ansel Brown, who'd handled Willie James' burial, Commissioner Udell funded and arranged for a long overdue grave marker. Additionally, he organized a church service to honor Willie James, a poignant tribute that had been absent at the time of his tragic death. Now, Douglas Udell stands as a testament to the evolving landscape of African-American political influence in Suwannee County, once among Florida's most conservative regions. Despite a district with a majority of white voters, Udell was elected chairman of the Suwannee County Commission in November 2007, showcasing a shift in the county's political dynamics. Also in 2006, Suwannee County Sheriff Tony Cameron demonstrated a rare commitment by attending the memorial service for Willie James, one of the few Caucasian people to do so. His presence spoke volumes, saying, I thought I should be there. 
Sheriff Cameron's assistance extended to aiding Douglas Hudell's research efforts. He reached out to Cynthia Goff's best friend from his office, revealing that Cynthia, although no longer residing in Live Oak, occasionally visits there. The friend shared that Cynthia was deeply distressed by Willie James' tragic fate, expressing, She did not intend for that to happen. I think it stayed with her all of her life. Cynthia never married and spent her life working in downtown stores, including the Van Priest Dime Store. This incident had a profound impact on everyone involved and disrupted their lives permanently. During that period, racism deeply influenced society and created a stark division between African American and Caucasian people. Caucasians were often considered superior, while African Americans faced unjust perceptions of inferiority. Over time, society has evolved and today, People from all backgrounds are treated with equal respect and offered opportunities regardless of their race. Presently, individuals of all races, including white people, embrace diversity and easily interact with one another. Yet some lingering perceptions suggest that Willie may have believed he could navigate a racially biased world, relying on charm, style, singing talent, and an unconventional job choice. The complexities of his motivations during those times continue to fuel discussions. It's hard to definitively say why Willie wrote the letter to Cynthia. Some might argue he wrote it out of pride in himself, believing he could break social barriers. On the other hand, it's also possible that Willie genuinely had feelings for Cynthia, hoping to build a connection despite the racial challenges of the time. The complexities of human emotions make it challenging to pinpoint a single motivation behind Willie's actions. The situation raised many questions about the role of fear, power dynamics, and societal pressures during those challenging times. The truth remains buried in traditional thinking, lingering racism, and the feeling of a justice that was never fully realized. So, we leave you with this. What are your thoughts on whether James truly chose not to save Willie, or if external factors hindered his ability to intervene? Additionally, considering the gravity of the situation, what punishment, in your opinion, would be fitting for the three men involved in taking Willie's life? We'd love to hear from you. If there's a case you'd like us to cover, don't hesitate to drop your recommendations in the comments section below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more captivating true crime stories. Until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled for the next mystery to unfold.